Okay, um, welcome to the second seminar in the series of seminars called CEOPS, uh, which is the psychology of political struggle. Uh, and this is a collaboration between PU, Peace Research Institute Oslo, and Psychology Students Without Borders, as well as the Department of Psychology at the University of Oslo. <coughs> uh, my name is Lisa, and this is Ayun. We are from Psychology Students Without Borders. Um, it is a student organization that are working towards increasing cultural knowledge among psychology students and how this can be used as a tool in understanding the, co the contemporary challenges we face in our society. And uh, this morning we are going to hear Fanny Nikolaisen give a short update on the current situation in South Sudan. And uh, next, Sigrun Marie Moss will talk about what the role of social identities play in the conflict. And then we have Kai Uxom, who will present his experiences from psychological fieldwork and psychological consequences of the conflict. And afterwards, we will leave about 30 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so first up, um, Fanny Nikolaisen. She's a research assistant at the Peace Research Institute Oslo and she will present a brief over, overview of the current situation in South Sudan. So please welcome Fanny Nikolaisen. Right. Thank you for that introduction and for having me here today. I'm glad to see uh, more people interested in uh, what's going on in uh, South Sudan. Um, so. Uh, I was asked to give a kind of overview of the situation in South Sudan, also touching upon some of the historical uh, background uh, as a background for uh, Sigrun and Kai's uh, later presentations. Okay, so um, since the current civil war broke out in uh, 2013, uh, South Sudan has uh, been referred to as a failing state, uh, as the people are suffering under state collapse, um, armed violence, human rights viol violations, and uh, famine, and the list uh, goes on, unfortunately. And so what I'm going to touch upon a little bit today is how did we get from this optimistic uh, celebration of a new nation back in 2011 to where we are today. And um, as any uh, historians would say, in order to understand um, the current situation, we have to look to the past. And so. I was uh, asked to kind of uh, give an overview of what's going on today, but also with some historical um, backlines. So please bear with me as I try to cram decades of uh, history into uh, 15 minutes. Um, but generally speaking, we can divide South Sudan's history into these four main periods. We have the pre-colonial and colonial rule leading us up to Sudan's independence in 1956 um, and the subsequent two civil wars before South Sudan became independent uh, in 2011 and now the current um, civil war. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly brief um, but emphasize a little bit on some of the colonial legacies that are affecting the situation today and how South Sudan um, came into being. And so. Starting with the colonial legacy, we'll have to see at the Anglo-Egyptian uh, condominium between 1899 and 1956. And um, although this was a joint rule be between Egypt uh, and uh, the British, Egypt uh, had very little influence in practice, so it was mostly British policies that were um, controlling uh, the colonial times. And so the British at the time were trying to kind of control half of the world, so they didn't really have the capacity to uh, occupy Sudan um, uh, at the time. And so instead there were a few policies that became very crucial to their colonial rule of Sudan. And so I'm going to touch upon um, two of the ones that have mostly affected South Sudan's independence. Um, and so the first one um, was what's been referred to kind of as the divide and rule policy. Uh, which in effect kind of separated the north and the south. And so while the British were concentrating uh, development uh, and investments um, and its political power in the north, uh, the southern provinces of today's South Sudan, so very little social and economic developments at the time. Um, and this was a way for uh, Britain to kind of uh, stop the spread of um, Islam and Arabic influences into the south 
but also they argued a way for them to uh, preserve what they perceived to be the African way of life um, in the South. And so uh, when the British later reversed this uh, policy, a lot of damage was already done in terms that by the time Sudan gained its independence in 1956, there were these major economic, political, uh, and social differences between the North uh, and the South, which had a huge then, impact on um, starting the later civil wars. The second uh, British policy that I'm going to touch upon um, that has affected South Sudan more in particular is the indirect rule through uh, these chiefdoms, which was a cheap and effective way for the British government um, or colonial power um, to govern the South. And so the British did this by dividing the southern provinces into administrative areas um, based on their perception of different tribal identities. And so the system uh, then created kind of a territorialized um, tribe system, which was then led by chiefs that were appointed by the British. And so Sigrun will probably maybe go into this a little bit later on, but um, there are numerous ethnic groups, obviously, in Sudan, South Sudan, and um, people's individual and group identities, they have these multiple aspects. Um, and so people identify themselves and others by using a range of different criteria. And so when the British were trying to institute, uh, institutionalize the, uh, this policy on the ground, they could uh, come into areas where these tribal affiliations or leadership, they weren't so clear cuts um, as they might have thought uh, in advance. But um, in situations like that, they would uh, forcibly move people around to kind of fit, fit with their perception of how uh, South Sudan should look like. And so the aim was then to build these series of self-contained tribal units uh, where that were structured and organized according to um, the tribal costume traditions and beliefs. And so this then led to this institutionalization um, of tribal identities or political tribalism as it's also been referred to later on. And this system increased the power of certain chiefs and the tribes that they were uh, um, leading, but at the other hand repressed others that weren't serving the British um, colonial interest um, to the same degree. And so this had a very negative effect on the interaction and cooperation between the various tribes. And as we'll see, it's kind of fostered this division and conflict um, as we can arguably still see the effects of today. So as I already mentioned, by the time the British left uh, Sudan in 1956, there were these major regional, regional differences um, between the Arab-dominated North, which was politically, socially, and economically a lot much stronger than the African um, South, who had been more sidelined during the British rule. And so upon independence, um, the southern prov provinces were therefore marginalized, underdeveloped, and they lacked this political unity to kind of take part um, in the ruling of a new and independent Sudan. And in addition to this, um, the chiefs who had previously enjoyed a position of power in the southern provinces under the colonial structures were very against this kind of new north northern dominated uh, state as it threatened their position of power. And so they had an invested interest to kind of keep this colonial, colonial structure that um, gave them power in place. And so, um, the South rebelled against the North, and the first civil war uh, officially started in 1955. And as it intensified in the 1960s, um, the South were uh, loose alliances of different rebel groups in the South were fighting for a greater self-rule. And so uh, the conflict came to an end in 1972, but the peace only lasted for about 10 years, um, as the North increasingly tried to um, impose Arabification and Islamification uh, through Sharia laws, for example, onto the South. And at the same, in the same period, um, oil resources were also found, so that complicated the mat matter further. And so the country um, scaled back into the second civil war, um, again, between uh, the government in Khartoum in the North, and now 
the southern rebel groups uh, were aligned under what they called the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army, also referred to as the SPLM. After years of uh, negotiation, the Second Civil War came to an end in 2005. Um, when Khartoum and the SPLM leader, John Garang, as you'll see to the right here, um, signed the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And so the agreement established a transitional period um, where the South would be governed as a semi-sovereign semi entity before the people would vote for their dependence uh, during a referendum in 2011. And in this transitional period, um, the SPLM, with the much support from the international community, were kind of scrambling to build the state structures and functions um, of a new and independent state. Um, and as the referendum came in 2011, almost 99% of the South Sudanese voted yes to independence. And so this was a huge victory for the South Sudanese, but also the international Communi diplomatic community, um, particularly Norway, the US, and the UK, who had helped this peace process um, for a long time. And despite the expected challenges with you know, continued development of building up a new uh, state, there were a lot of optimism and hope at the time. Uh, however, uh, as you now know, this was very short-lived as um, some of the internal um, differences between the SBLM in terms of how South Sudan should be ruled started bubbling back up to the surface. And so the political situation intensified in mid-2013 when President Kiir um, dismissed Vice President Riek Machar and um, escalated then till the breakout of the new civil war uh, on December 15, 2013. And so at first, um, the civil war was, uh, the current uh, war was uh, concentrated in the greater Upper Nile region. However, as time has passed, it's now spread to include uh, eight out of the 10 original states. Um, there's some uh, discussion of whether, how many states there are there now, but that's some different points. Um, and so the main factions is the government army, the SBLA, who are loyal to President uh, Salva Kiir. And then, uh, then you have the SPLA in opposition who are loyal to former Vice President Riek Moshar. However, the conflict picture is a lot more complicated than that because a lot of smaller armed groups have mobilized on the local level uh, following ethnic lines. And so it's not just you know these two main factions fighting each other. It's a lot more fluent and alliances, they keep shifting uh, as the conflict has gone on. So media and other observers have oftentimes uh, pointed to these inherent ethnic conflicts or personal power struggles between the two leaders as a reason for why this uh, conflict broke out. These explanations are a bit too simplistic, and I want to uh, kind of point back to some of the things that we've already touched upon. So the conflict is maybe better explained uh, if we look at um, the weak state structures that were put in place before its independence in combination with this neo-patrimonial system where the political power is mostly based um, on these informal patronage networks. So in other words, um, this ties back to the colonial legacies, of, as I mentioned, um, where there is this tradition for the military leaders who now turned politicians uh, to exploit the political tribalism and ethnic identities as a way to mobilize support for the factions and interests that they're representing um, as they are competing for power and influences against each other. So despite major international diplomatic engagement to end this conflict um, and an actual peace agreement in 2015, um, the conflict has now entered its fourth year. Thousands of people have died. 1.6 million people have fled to neighboring countries while um, almost 2 million people are internally displaced. And um, the humanitarian situation continues to worsen. So in February of this year, the UN declared a famine in uh, two counties in South Sudan, and this is the first time a famine has been declared anywhere in the world in six years. And so it's very hard to make any predictions of uh, where the conflict is going in South Sudan, um, but in order to turn the situation around, um, 
one of the things that needs to happen at least is um, from where I see it, um, a cessation of hostilities where the main uh, factions lay down their arms and that the leaders are brought back to the negotiation table. Um, and so one can hope that uh, it's uh, gonna turn for the better sometime soon. And um, yeah, on that somewhat depressive note, uh, I'm gonna give the word over to uh, Sigrun. Thank you, Fanny Nikolaisen. Uh, it was great that you would present the current situation uh, of the conflict. And um, next up, we are introducing Sigrid Mariemos. She is an associate professor at the University of Oslo at the Department of Psychology. Some of her research interests are intergroup relations and intergroup conflict, social identity, and political leadership. Drawing on interview data from Sudan and South Sudan, she will show how respondents presented the national identity strategies of the government of Sudan and comment on the role of social identities in South Sudan today. So please welcome Sigrun Mariemos. Thank you very much for that. And thank you to uh, the Psychology Students Without Borders and to Prio for hosting this and for inviting me. And thank you to Fanny for an excellent introduction on a very long and complex um, process that you presented excellent in, in 15 minutes. So I will talk to you today uh, also fairly briefly as to the complexity of these issues, but I will talk to you today on um, about social identities in Sudan and South Sudan. This is based on my research data that I did for my PhD in political psychology, mainly from 2011 and 2012, but I'm gonna try to draw some of the parallels into um, the situation now as well, and think that this is gonna be interesting also for the current situation. Um, so the main focus of my talk is gonna be on political leadership and social identities in Sudan, which then also included uh, South Sudan. My research was done in a period where the two countries then split into two. And I also want to, because we are doing this within you know, psychology, uh, let me just spend a couple of minutes kind of framing this within um, a psychological framework. In terms of political leadership and identities, there are many voices within social psychology and political psychology that feels that we've kind of lost track of this. So there was a, a great emphasis after the Second World War on looking at processes in psychology of authority, of obedience, on the role of leadership, leadership connected with prejudice and so forth. But now we kind of, or some researchers um, think that we've kind of lost traction of this uh, and that we should have more research on the link between political leadership and identities. So a starting point for studying leadership can be looking at social identities. These have often been presented as something passive. In a lot of the literature, social identities is presented as something we kind of stumble on, cues in our environment that kind of forges these identities. But where there is research now emerging um, on seeing leaders as potential entrepreneurs of identity. So there's research, for example, by Haslam and Reicher, uh, looking at where political leadership tries to forge unity through looking at uh, entrep entrepreneurs of solidarity, but also at leaders trying to cause fragmentation uh, and then looking at leaders as entrepreneurs of hatred. Tashfell, already in 1981, one of our uh, um, or of others in, in social psychology said that a comprehensive account of outgroup hate must include the notion that racism and hate may not be a mere consequence of the human psyche but may have been deliberately and knowingly mobilized. One theoretical background that I've been using in my research in Sudan but also in Rwanda and Zanzibar 
is a, a framework within social psychology looking at the value of shared superordinate identities. So how can we in conflict get people to unite under a shared and common identity, which then in research is found to have positive impact on evaluations of the outgroup and cognitions about the outgroup and helping behavior and so forth if we manage to see former outgroup members increasingly as in-group members. One of the main models on this is the common in-group identity model, which basically says that if we get people to emphasize a shared superordinate identity, for example, being Sudanese, that will lead to intergroup harmony because one is then seeing the other people who also fit within that identity in more positive light. There is another theoretical model that questions some of the assumptions in this, the in-group projection model, saying that if there is a hierarchy within the super shared superordinate identity or there is competition for which group is more prototypical in the hierarchy, that might not be accepted and might not lead to then intergroup harmony. So for example, if people from the south of Norway and people from the north of Norway are in disagreement as to which group is more prototypical Norwegian, the Norwegian identity might then not foster as much intergroup harmony. There is also issue of identity content definitions so that people may share a superordinate identity without necessarily sharing its psychological meaning or content. So for example, in research in the US, one often finds that being American is often tied stronger to uh, aspects of Christianity for black Americans, whilst it's not that prominent for other groups of the population. So the research focus that I've been working on mainly in Sudan is I was curious as to what is the national identity strategy in Sudan from um, looking at the government in Khartoum, the National Congress Party. I was interested in how are the subordinate identities, so group identities or class identities or ethnic identities structured within the national identity and what are people's responses to such a um, strategy. I was interested in are there any lines of inclusion, are there any lines of exclusion, what are the consequences for people in terms of identity policies and so forth. I'm going to run you th quickly through the methodology of the study that I did. Um, I did semi-structured interviews, uh, mainly one-to-one -one interviews using uh, two uh, research assistants. Also did two focus group interviews with people from the Nuba Mountains and also with people from Darfur. And I did six kind of spontaneous group interviews where I thought I was meeting people on my own, but then more people turned up, which was excellent. And the sample was then um, 51 from the general population and 17 political leaders, um, three from the National Congress Party, but also then several opposition po politicians and uh, also then SPLM representatives in, in Juba. I did the work in mainly in Khartoum, but I also did interviews in Kasala in the east and also in Juba in the south. And I did this over three months, over two visits, 2011 and 12 which then included periods of heightened tension. And the analysis I did was a constructivist thematic analysis. So looking at this, um, what I found, um, and I need to emphasize that this is not necessarily something that the government is officially putting forth, so this was both corroborated with statements from the government, but also mainly from what the respondents that I interviewed said. So people were pointing at, when I asked them, what is the identity strategy of the government in Khartoum? People pointed at this unity in compliance strategy, uh, where, as Fanny mentioned earlier, one touches on the policies of Islamification or Arabization, or also being called a civilization project. Um, that is then put forth by the government. One of the NCP representatives that I interviewed in Khartoum said that we need to make real unity, social unity especially. We should build this on Arabic language. Islam connects us all and the country itself. And of course, a lot of Sudanese would disagree strongly with this because they 
hold other languages and other religions. And as Fanny said, there's a myriad of different characteristics that different groups within a very diverse country would, would identify with. According then to most of the respondents I interviewed, and of course there are gonna be different incentives for different people to put forth different versions of what is the situation in Sudan. But what I got from these respondents was that there was large disagreement that this caused an identity hierarchy. So basically people were pointing at that the first class citizens that kind of came out as a consequence of this policy were Arabs, Muslims speaking Arabic. So these were seen as first class citizens in the country as a consequence of this policy. A representative for the first class citizens would then be the, the um, president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. It was also emphasized in the material that you should not be too Arab. So if your forefathers immigrated from say Egypt seven generations ago, you are seen as a foreigner and you do not qualify as a first-class citizen. Second-class citizens um, that people then said that this led to, uh, in the government's opinion, um, were those from the East. So here represented by one of the leaders of the Beya Congress, a former rebel group. Third-class citizens um, that people said that this strategy led to were then those from the West or those from Darfur, here represented by Darfuri Khalil Ibrahim, who was the former head of the justice and equality movement and who was killed by the Sudanese army in 2011. And then fourth class citizens in this structure are those then from the South, here represented by Salva Kiir of SPLM. I asked a southern Sudanese man in Khartoum about this in 2012, about the national identity, and he said, I always feel like the last segment, not the second or third class citizen, but the very last. This is a sentiment spread from official hold. This policy, according to the respondents, has a, a variety of practical consequences for people. So people said that it influenced their job opportunities, access to scholarships, potential for marriage, social status, etc. Um, a political representative in, in Khartoum explained that the government's identity approach um, excludes the peripheries and only focuses on certain Sudanese. Uh, another politician in Khartoum says, discrimination happens both socially and officially. People discriminate socially. You can't marry them, then why would you hire them? About then these people who are in the other categories in this hierarchy. Talking to a female professor in Khartoum, she said the Arab language is very colonizing, which is good for their, their government's identity project by spreading the Arab language and Islam they hope to get a shared Muslim Arab identity and a strong Arab state. Other identities are then a problem for the unified Muslim state. And a lot of the respondents were saying, this does not fit with what we want Sudan to be or what we see Sudan being. The alternative identity strategy that has been um, presented in, in by some politicians in Sudan has been more along the lines of unity in diversity. Uh, this, in my respondents, were put forth by the opposition parties, uh, but also by most of the general population respondents. Now, of course, again, there might be different incentives for presenting that you are closer to this approach than another approach, and former governments has also uh, not necessarily taken this approach. Uh, in this approach, one values the diversity uh, and accepts the diversity of the country and opposes then this identity hierarchy that the government is putting forth in, in, um, in Sudan. In the material that I have from Sudan, this was the strongly articulated uh, point of view also among those qualifying as first class citizens. So about two thirds of the material qualified 
um, as first-class citizens, and they were very much putting forth this view um, of, of the situation. One political leader in Khartoum said, the government sees Sudan as an Arab Islam country. The ideal identity policy would be a mix between nationalism and multiculturalism. Whilst a civil society representative in Khartoum said, if we had this, rights for all, there will be no risk of anyone being reduced to a nigger in an Arab world. This identity strategy um, that people are, are identifying here has of course had large consequences for South Sudan and many have argued that it contributed to the split um, where Sudan became two different countries. I asked a SPLM representative in Juba in 2011 um, whether there has been a feeling of Sudan-ness in, uh, in South Sudan and he said, you feel a sense of nationalism to the point of view that the state does something for you. We never had a sense of oneness with the country. Here in the South, we all felt the state in the North only took and never gave. There was no sense of loyalty, pride, or sense of citizenship to Sudan as a whole. Um, I also asked a South Sudanese woman in Khartoum about uh, the national policy and she agreed saying, the government here in Khartoum is representing the Arab or Islamic identity. The rest of us feel marginalized. The government uses its race as an instrument to discriminate against the people to let some feel that they are not Sudanese. This brings negative emotions to those excluded. We are the black and we are suffering. Asking then, after the separation, whether the separating into two different countries had strengthened a feeling of being South Sudanese together, I asked uh, another SPLM representative in Juba, and he said, the reason for separation is not that we want to live better. We wanted to avoid living in the status quo, to avoid living like we did over the last 50 years. This will be better than being second-class citizens in your own country. So that this kind of degrading into lower status citizens in their own country was emphasized throughout in the material. A student in Juba said, there is no feeling of South Sudanese nationalism. It's not easy to build this. It needs a lot of time and great efforts by both the government and the civil society. Many complain that they will suffer more now from the South than they did when the South was still under the North. So there we also see tendencies to divisions within the South. Um, intergroup conflict um, has then, as Fanny um, showed us, uh, been increasing also in the South. I, uh, some people that I talked to in Khartoum were saying, the Nur and the Dinka hate each other. This is an ethnic group conflict. But I think it's a very important aspect, as Fanny also pointed out, and, and this is my kind of key focus in this uh, work, that the, the existence of social identities and the use of social identities by different key figures are two very different things. A student in Juba said the group problems in South Sudan are often seen as historical problems. Even the new generations, they say that they have to be, it has to be like this, that we are supposed to be organized in our tribes. And I then want to emphasize this aspect, the leadership mobilization of these social identities. Um, it's a lovely drawing of what fear and ignorance can go together and brew hatred and then be used by different key actors. Talking to the, uh, one of the SPLM representatives in 2011, uh, he emphasized that the next generation of leaders will need to put behind them this ethnic way of looking at themselves. We need a new generation who will draw their identity from their nation, not from their tribe. 
whilst then a student in South Sudan said, our politicians lead people to go to their tribes. So she emphasizes this aspect of the use of these social identities. Their strategies lead to this. They could quite easily avoid this. There is an easy solution if they could use more sensitive language and let us be one nation and let us be together. So then again, these are then not seen as essentialist categories, but then categories in use by political leadership. The conclusions that I've drawn from this study um, is that leadership influences categorizations, uh, but the population responses are not po passive. So as I said uh, in the introduction, that social psychology or psychology at large has largely ignored to some extent the, the way that political leadership can, or leadership in general, can use these identities to then foster different feelings of inclusion and inclusion, exclusion. Identity negotiations are definitely an intricate process, even in coercive contexts, and that within psychology, I would emphasize that it's necessary with an increased focus on this. I also think that studies from Sudan um, gives us valuable material as to see that the, the just emphasizing a superordinate identity, so emphasizing being Sudanese, does not necessarily lead to intergroup harmony. As we saw um, in, in the beginning, uh, this is often put forth uh, as then a road to intergroup harmony if you manage to then focus on a shared identity, but then if it's structured very hierarchically and people get different positions and different value within such a hierarchy, then this notion of it still leading to intergroup harmony will then be um, quite logical that that might be difficult. Uh, lastly, I also want to emphasize that categorization processes are acutely contextual. Um, in psychology, ironically enough, we're not very good at emphasizing context, and this context dependency needs to be acknowledged to a larger extent also within our field that has a tendency to rely extensively on experiments and lab studies where we look at processes involving social identities as more um, divorced from the actual context they take place in. If you do uh, want to read more about the work that I've been doing in Sudan, I have a publication in political psychology on identity hierarchy within the Sudanese superordinate identity from 2016, for those interested in that. And um, then I just want to say thank you, and I look forward to a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been really interesting to listen to your presentation. Um, and right now we're just going to have a 10 minute break. So you can just grab some more breakfast or whatever you like. Um, so yeah, we'll start up again in 10 minutes. Okay, then it's time to start again. Lastly, today we have uh, Kaio Uxom. He is a psychologist working for Doctors Without Borders, and he will talk about um, experiences from his psychological fieldwork in South Sudan in 2014, and how psychologists work in the field, as well as psychological consequences of the conflicts. So um, please welcome Kaio Uxom. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's very. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to be uh, a part of this Security uh, Student Written Answer project. It's very it's very nice. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my experiences from uh, South Sudan, where I was working as a psychologist uh, two and a half years um, ago, and. Um, um, I went out with uh, Doctors Without Borders, so I'm going first to talk a bit about um, MSF and uh, 
um, yeah, how they work a bit about this first. Yeah. Um, Doctors Without Borders, were, they started um, in 1972 um, uh, with their uh, help um, in the um, Biafra conflict. Uh, Red Cross was uh, involved at that, at that uh, time, uh, but MSF thought they didn't do enough, so they was yeah they thought it was a, a bit too chicken. <laughs> so yeah, it was five uh, French doctors going down to the Biafra conflict and just putting up putting up a tent and starting to uh, yeah help people with different kind of wounds and stuff. Okay, when uh, about the, the um, when it comes to the mental health, uh, in 1998, um, MSF included mental health as a part of their program. Um, so yeah, it's starting to be 20 years ago now. In 2016, it was provided over 200,000 consultations worldwide by MSF workers, uh, basically trauma-related therapy, and basically in Sudan, Iraq, Russia, Congo, and Kashmir. So um, it has been um, rapid, uh, rapid going up the number of consultations. Um, MSF's mental health care aims primarily to reduce people's symptoms and improve their ability to function. Uh, often this work is done by local counselors, especially trained by MSF. MSF psychologists or psychiatrists provide technical support and clinical supervision. So this is always the, the aim for uh, MSF when they start to work in a specific area, they want to provide knowledge to the locals and to uh, so they can uh, maintain the project further yeah okay yeah uh, people come with a different uh, different kinds of uh, for different kinds of reasons of course it's uh, it's um, lots of ch uh, children in earthquakes trauma regarding sexual violence, uh, viol uh, violent conflicts. Um, so as an MSF mental health uh, worker, you listen to their stories and help them find ways to cope and move on with their lives. Yeah, basically. Um, uh, when it comes to the sever severely disturbed people, like uh, people with psychotic dis disorders, uh, heavy traumatized disorders and um, severe depression. It's a challenge because these people uh, need often um, medical treatment as well, and uh, it's not so easy to um, to um, to su sustain uh, a, a well-functional program, so to speak, when it comes to the uh, psychiatric drugs. Mm. Okay. Okay, MSF in South, uh, South Sudan, um, they have been working in the region uh, that today constitutes the Republic of South Sudan since 1983, um, during the civil uh, war. Today they employ more than 3,000 South Sudanese staff and 330 international staff to respond to a wide range of medical emergencies uh, and provide free and high quality health care to people in need in 17 project locations across seven of South Sudan, Sudan's 10 states. So if we have a um, brief look at the map here, we see that in the gray area east in the South Sudan, it's a lot of conflicts and it's primarily there the, where MSF have their projects going on and running. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah. 
I'm now going to talk a bit about the project I was involved in uh, two and a half years ago. It was um, in a region, it was in a state called um, Upper, uh, Upper Nile State, uh, in an area called Maban, and the refugee camp was called Duro. Um, the general objective uh, for MSF in uh, Doro was to, uh, to reduce the mortality and the morbidity among the refugees in the Doro camp. The, the specific objective was to uh, make them uh, make sure that they, they had the um, um, primary health care services which in fact um, MSF was the only one, we, we, we were the only provider with basic primary health care in the, in the refugee camp. So, yeah. So, I'm going to talk a bit about now how I uh, was um, experiencing the, the mission from a psychologist's point of view and how it is to work in the field as a psychologist. This picture is, um, I took it from the air and you can see um, it's from August 2014 during the rainy season so the, the it's, it's green and yeah, blooming. <laughs> so this is um, where we lived, it's the compound and the typical Doctors Without Borders cars standing in the front there. Um, in the tent to the right side, it's a pharmacy where we store the drugs. Um, and we lived in, uh, in um, tents and that sort of stuff uh, to the left. Yeah, I'm going to, sh going to show you. Okay. Um, when it comes to the um, mission in uh, Doro, um, MSF started medical activities in November 2011, um, and it was following the influx of re refugees crossing the border from Blue, Nam Blue Nile State, which is uh, a state very south in uh, Sudan, and into Upper Nile State in the north or south, south of Sudan to flee the conflict. Uh, and it's about 50,000 refugees in Doro. No one actually knows the number, but I guess it's around 50,000. Um, yeah, and people are coming all the time. So, yeah. The tribe, um, the main tribe in the Doro refugee uh, camp is uh, a tribe called Uduk. It's um, the tribe, uh, it's a Christian, Christian tribe and the people are um, very nice and um, yeah, easy to talk with and very easy going, uh, very nice people. <laughs> um, it's not so very interesting uh, when you talk about animals in the era. It's not like the jungle with the uh, monkeys and uh, lions and stuff. Um, I managed to see the country from the air um, very often actually, and it's very uh, it's humid and it's uh, bald and it's not so much things going on when you talk about animals. <laughs> so yeah. But uh, in the compound, it was a lot of toads everywhere, and it was some big spiders, and yeah, I saw some scorpions here and there, and a snake, a couple of snakes, yeah. Just been some fun facts. Um, yeah. So, um, my mission was to work as a psychologist uh, in a mental health team consisting of 11 national employees 
and these people were also refugees themselves. Most of them were Uduk from the Uduk tribe. Um, so we provided therapy sessions with people in the camp who needed, needed it. Most of the people we did counseling with were depressed or traumatized or both. Um, I was the last international psychologist working in the clinic, so um, one of my main goals was to make sure that the team was able to carry on the routine by themselves without help from international psychologists because it was uh, they were very used to have international psychologists uh, running the team I was the eighth so it was like yeah new ones all the time uh, yeah uh, I Sam from um, he was um, um, running the team when I left um, and he had he was a very talented guy he had a bachelor's degree from Ethiopia and uh, was a very uh, good clinician as well so it was the project was in safe hands when I left so to speak okay um, yeah uh, when one international psychologist leave a project, you have to do a handover for, for the next person to come. So the next person knows what, what to do and what should be the main focus. This is um, what the previous psychologist um, wrote when I came. And um, as we see here, um, she was uh, working there from February to August 2014 and um, the team uh, was uh, um, at that time had 11 national staff working, one mental health supervisor, six uh, psycho psychosocial workers um, and four mental health home visitors. So uh, the six uh, supervisors were working in the clinic and the four home visitors were was um, visiting the people out in the camp. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if I need to talk about all all that is written here. You can maybe ask questions later. Um, yeah. So this is how it look looks like when you uh, get a pro project. Um, it's divided into specific uh, objectives and the first objective and the most important one was to uh, ensure that there was an effective referral system between the um, mental health department in the clinic. So all these abbreviations OPD, IPD, ITFC and so on is just different parts of the clinic. Um, uh, some taking care of the pregnant women, some taking care of uh, malnutrition, um, um, yeah, inpatient, outpatient, and so on. Mm. Yeah, and if mental health um, problems is um, found if, if they found out that, that the patient has, has a me mental health problem, it's important that they refer to the where we are, the mental health uh, yeah, area. Yeah. So this is uh, the team I was working with. Um, so um, it was a very nice team and. Uh, um, I Sam is the one to the right there, the bachelor's degree from Ethiopia in psychology. And as we see, it, it is basically men uh, working. And this is a bit part of the culture as well. Uh, the men is working and the women is staying home with the children and do, doing the more home, homely routines. And in the front of the picture, it's um, we can see two men holding hands and it's, it's very it was very physical there and it was very usual to see two men 
walk in the streets hand in hand. And it's not anything to do with sexual orientation, it's just, yeah, the normal costume. It's very nice. So, uh, um, the picture in the left um, uh, is actually a picture uh, which is meant to symbol a person with uh, mental distor disorders. So, it may look a bit funny, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, we had some struggle with um, with. Um, um, make people understand what the mental problem was. What is depression? What is anxiety? And uh, how to um, how to provide this information to the people who are depressed and have anxiety. So this is one way we uh, used uh, yeah, a picture to show. Okay, if you have too many struggles in your life. It gets too heavy. It's a physical way to mm, present the depression. In the right, on the right side, um, it's Isam and me having a lecture about anxiety and depression to uh, to uh, health promoters who was going around in the camp and. Um, they were distributing information about mental problems. So yeah, we did some lectures with the, with uh, these people from time to time. Um, mm. On the left side, um, we see one of the guys from the mental health team uh, doing uh, an education to uh, locals. And this is how the, the education was done. It was the old-fashioned way. This young man was very eager to be a psychologist himself. <laughs> Jetta, 27 years old. Nice man. And on the right side, um, uh, it was during one of these vaccination campaigns. And uh, often we just went around in the camp and was uh, hanging around with the with the people, and um, um, it was uh, had these thoughts um, from the telly running on inside my brain. Just this is like to see a ref refugee camp in Africa, like you have seen so many times on television. It was like many small people running towards and. Um, screaming Kavaja, which, which means strange white people, <laughs> and um, touching the skin. And I remember one small child even started to cry when he saw me. <laughs> that was so scary. <laughs> uh, in the mental health uh, area, we also had this. Um, focus on the mother-child relations because a lot of the children, uh, mothers uh, were depressed and um, the, the children, the interaction was not so good so uh, we had also uh, a lot of trainings with, uh, with the mothers how to make sure that they have a good, um, do, the good do the right things when they uh, interact with their children. And the national team did a very great job there. I was very impressed. It's very important, of course. Okay, so, um, so um, the different parts of the camp were divided into um, yeah, different um, organization uh, tribe-wise. And uh, the leader of the, of these uh, small organizations was a sheikh, and it's a, the one to the left is a sheikh. You can see his fancy clothes, and yeah, he's, he's the leader of that that part. Uh, on the right side is the donkey transport. It's um, when patients uh, 
was ill, they were transported from the, um, the area where they lived to the, um, to the clinic with a don by a donkey. So it, it took some time, sometimes. <laughs> On the picture on the left side, it's uh, a so-called tukul. It's, um, it's a cottage um, of grass and mud where we lived in. Uh, I myself couldn't find so much peace there. Uh, it was a bit difficult to sleep, actually, so I was moving into a tent after some time. But um, it was a nice cottage. A lot of spiders in there. <laughs> On the right side is Jetta again, and uh, here he has a snake in his hand. He was doing a con uh, some counseling with a patient, and suddenly a poisonous snake is falling from the roof down to his uh, feet, and uh, he had to stop the counseling and kill the snake instead. <laughs> so it's. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's. Um, I want to tell you a couple of stories about how I was experiencing the people down there because um, the Udik tribe was actually used to be on the run. They had been refugees for a lot of years already and uh, I was uh, I have to say that I was very impressed by how they managed to be in that situation in uh, under these conditions uh, and um, I remember uh, once it was me and one of the guys from the team had to tell uh, a woman with uh, a, a AIDS um, um, that uh, she had this sickness and it was actually nothing we could do b b because we hadn't the right kind of a medication and she had the the the, the sickness had gone uh, gone she had been sick for a long time she was actually just laying down on her bed and didn't manage to eat or uh, talk or anything she was very thin probably around 50 years old uh, and uh, we told her the, about her the symptoms of her disease and uh, what, she, what she thought about that and she said it's no problem I have no problem with that so if it's God's will it's it's okay so it's an example of how they managed to survive under these conditions. Um, the other story I want to tell is a girl, she was probably 15, 16, and she came to the mental health area one day, um, and uh, we asked her how she was doing and what we could help her with. Uh, she looked sad, she looked depressed actually. After a while, she said, uh, I have no food and I have no soap, but I'm doing fine. Um, and before that, she had told us that she had been raped by her husband for five years, uh, constantly. So, it's um, it's not so easy to yeah. I could feel that I was struggling a bit with my tears uh, sometimes, and um, I was very impressed by many of the people down there and um, how they managed to continue with their lives. Um, yeah, of course it's a lot of challenges um, regarding the culture, the language, everything. Um, I was uh, once Ice Man Me, we had uh, we had this idea to start a group with uh, a group for elderly uh, old people in the in the camp, all depressed people, 
because it was a, a group which didn't get so much attention. And we were um, talking to the, the sheikh ab about this, the guy I told you, the man on the left side. And um, and he, it, it seemed like the, he, he did understand us and uh, we arranged a meeting the next week. So, so we, he had enough time to speak with the other people in his area and see if he could find some people who were interested in having a, a kind of group where the elderly could communicate about being in the camp and yeah, depressed. But the week after, um, when we arrived back to the to the sheikh, he was sitting there with a with a boy. He was the boy was 17 or 18 years old with mental disabilities. So it was some misunderstanding in the communication. So it's it was some things like this happened quite often actually. So. Um, For my part, I just had more, I became more and more laid back as time went by and yeah, things, um, it was important to try to focus on the right things. Um, of course, inside the, um, the team, uh, the national team in the compound, people were uh, often frustrated and tired and it was, um, sometimes disagreements there as well, of course. Um, I remember some, some, quirk, uh, some, okay, yeah, some heavy um, disagreements with a midwife. Yeah, it was a bit disagreements with temperament from time to time. <laughs> and that's not the problem. The, the, it, ha it has to happen, disagreements. It's more about how you manage to, to solve it. So uh, a bit about the daily routine. Um, we wake up in the morning. It was ice cold showers outdoors. Mm, the whole national team was surrounded or sitting around this table. Every, everyone was on Facebook, Twitter and so on. Mm, yeah. In the clinic, we had three international doctors, medical doctors on the left side. I call them the Doro Angels. I think they like that. Uh, very um, yeah, nice and talented doctors. On the right side, uh, guess what? That's a bar. That's a local bar. So this serve beers through the, the hole there. So we sat there uh, a lot in the evenings and we were chilling, relaxing. Um, I was actually planning to talk a bit about that, that I was not working all the time because as you guys have been talking about, um, the security situation in a United state was not so good. So the whole team couldn't work 24-7. Uh, Some people had to go down to Juba because on the plane on the right side it was just 12 seats and we were like 16 17 in the team so i was a lot in juba and um yeah, a bit too much actually um so in the beginning it, it was all okay to read a book and drink some wine and have some cigarettes but in the end it was a bit boring i was a lot on the plane <laughs> a lot in the air <laughs> yeah I think I'm um, beginning to uh, be finished here. Some party picks in the end. This is an uh, international team on the right side. It's a cold shower on the left. Uh, it was very cold in the winter. <laughs> very. <laughs> and it's a farewell dance on the left side. And uh, on the right side, it's another picture from the international team where we lived in the, in the compound. Uh, I think that was the last one. Yeah. 
So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kai, for your interesting, um, for giving us interesting insights in uh, how it is to work as a um, psychologist in the field. Um, we have uh, about half an hour, I think, for questions. Um, first, I would like to inform you that this um, seminar is being recorded and will be published as a podcast on Prio's homepage and also at psykologistudenterutengrenser.no. Um, so yeah, I think we just uh, maybe take the questions first and then you can answer them all together at the end. So you can please sit down there. Any questions? Yeah? My name is Endres de Janssen. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working in Sudan, South Sudan and so on. So I'm very, very happy that, you know, PRIO and the university took this initiative to uh, to again put the Sudan on the agenda uh, and for discussion and also very much appreciate, you know, there are new faces coming into this field of study, so that's very much appreciated. Um, um, I have just uh, comments and then I have a few questions. Uh, so if you allow me, just comments to your presentation on identity. Uh, I, I think, it's, of course, it's an extremely interesting topic. It's been studied a lot uh, over the years from very different angles, you know, anthropology, history, geography, uh, but not so much psychology. So, so I thought that was very interesting to get your insights on that. Now, looking at, you know, Sudanese identity in 2011, 2012, you can say that's a little bit too late because already you then had a split and, um, and, uh, and everything people would say about that at that time would be influenced by the political context. Uh, however, I thought, you know, in your comments, and maybe you've done that elsewhere, you could have done more out of the issue of, you know, ethnicity and identity, also on power, you know, how, how that's used, especially you mentioned NCP, you know, but also other others, and then, uh, I also thought, you know, the issue of race, you, you could have uh, elaborated, you were touching it, but, but I think that's absolutely critical. And just as, in, you know, when you have these uh, uh, categories, you know, first class, second class, you know, there's almost like an anecdote, um, and I'm, I, I know I'm going to be too long now, but, but anyway. Um, you know, I was part of the peace negotiations, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, also on Darfur. What was very striking, very interesting to me, was that the issue of race was much more contentious on the Darfur negotiations than the North-South negotiations. And I never quite understood why. But it has something to do with identity. It has something to do with race, of course. Uh, it has something to do with something. And I didn't get it because it was not such a dominant feature in those uh, negotiations. And maybe that's something for you to follow up um, as you are progressing in your in your work then finally on a comment to yours I thought that your uh, the photograph of the sheikh and you sitting down is a very interesting photograph of Sudanization and identity he's an Uduk chief but you call him a sheikh the Arab term he's wearing the Jalabiya you know he's wearing the well he probably has an imma but but you know he's wearing the skull cap and so on he's taking on the Arab identity Nobody's forcing him to do that, and I think that relates very close to the work of Leif Mung on the Nuba Mountains and so on, how people take on that, you know, for all their, all their own reasons. Now, um, then I'll, uh, the historical presentation, of course, as a historian, very much appreciated it. I think it's good. You could have taken it much further back on this issue, the history of violence. South Sudan is a history of violence. Slave raiding, intertribal you know, warfare, intertribal warfare, and so on, for decades and centuries and so on. And that, you know, has done something to the population. Then you had the CPA and, you know, the euphoria of, of independence and then very soon the utter destruction of independence and what you've seen now. Now, during the negotiations, the issue of um, the trauma of a war population was never really properly addressed. I always felt very bad about that. So I'm very happy that, you, you know, I very much appreciate the work that you did, but I have then two specific questions, you know, maybe three, and one is very large, so it's very difficult. Now, during the negotiations, one reason that 
the trauma of the population, especially in the South, was not on the agenda, was that the representatives from the South would say, well, we have our own African ways of dealing with these issues. Now, so when you were working as a psychologist in the field, seeing patients and so on, could you say a little bit more about your, uh, coming from a Western modern tradition, in relation to the African way of doing things? Was there a clash? Was it in parallel? Did you try to work together? How do you deal with the local issues? Second, uh, and this is a, again, you know, uh, from my own background, uh, you know, having spoken a lot with South Sudanese, uh, you know, over the years, it seems to me that the trauma of the present civil war, it's much tougher to deal with than the previous civil war. They're much more traumatized now. And people that were not traumatized in the same manner in the past are now really traumatized. Could you say something about that? I know that you worked on people coming in from, say, Sudan across the border, but still, is, have you done any reflections on that? And is it correct, the sense I have, that the current civil war is much worse you know, to deal with in a, in a psychological manner? And, 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 process. and then, you know, now I'm working for the UNDP and we are working on uh, transitions. And I'm just wondering if you have ideas, FMSF have um, something to, um, uh, you know, to, to how to deal with these issues in a better way, how we can integrate that, you know, the work that you're doing better in these transitions out of conflict. Because I think it's very important. And I think part of the reason things fell apart in South Sudan was that we did not adequately address the, 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 the post-conflict trauma of, an, you know, of a conflict, conflict environment that had gone on for decades and centuries. So thanks a lot. Also had a question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Well, you could call it a question, but I think it's more of a comment. I'm Mari Tanes. I'm the uh, chair of the support group for Sudan and South Sudan. And um, um, I agree with Andre that the issue of, I don't want to call it race because I consider human beings one race, but racism is clearly um, a factor here. Um, we, ha we have to bear in mind that up to even after CPA, uh, Sudan was taking slaves from South Sudan as a tradition that was normal. Um, I think that is the way racism is a really important issue when it comes to this hierarchy. Um, the second is the issue of a national Identity. If you go to Kenya, you can easily ask any Kenyan you want, and they will know they're Kenyans. But you saw during the election two, two periods ago, and you will see it again now in the election in August, how easy it was to go back and trigger the tribal issue, and how it has become a really serious political factor, hampering the country's development. So the issue of tribal, put tri putting tribes up against each other, uh, I just visited Nuba Mountains, which is part of Sudan, and there was one thing they were very clear about. We are Nubians. We are Nuba people. There were many tribes, but that was not the issue. Another thing that was also not the issue was religious issues. They could intermarry. They were not at all concerned about that. They really had this, what you are asking for, this national identity, if, if you can call it that in this area. So um, that's the big question. How do you actually create a national identity that goes cross tribal? I wish I had the answer. <laughs> yeah. Also have a question here. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Fadil Anur. 
I'm Sudanese from Darfur, um, human rights activist. Uh, I had been to Norway in uh, 2014. Uh, in Darfur, I worked with uh, Oxfam as a protection officer. Uh, I left Sudan 2009 and also uh, to Uganda and back to Sudan after South Sudan after independence. With, uh, I work with uh, organizations uh, called uh, Mantese. I'm, uh, I'm leading a project a coordinator program in uh, Bantu. So when the, uh, the second war in South Sudan started, I'm on the field and I've seen also so many uh, chaos and atrocities on the ground. So uh, the presentation uh, is very good, uh, three papers. I cannot manage to capture all the point uh, that has been presented, but uh, I have a question and comment. So in the historical background of Sudan history, uh, the paper that they talk about uh, 19, uh, uh, 18, tw uh, 20. So first we have to know that Sudan is uh, uh, it's not formed by Sudanese. Sudan has been formed, Sudan of today, uh, or recent Sudan has been formed by colonial. After destroyed uh, many kingdoms that struggling against the colonialism in Sudan. The group leading the power in Sudan now, so they are, uh, their kingdoms have been destroyed, but later on because they living in the north, close to Egypt, they make an, an alliance with the colonialism that to be in Sudan and to represent their Sudan, uh, the colonial interest in Sudan. And this group, they define the Sudan into their own image, that Sudan should be an Arab and Islam or Muslim country, which is not really in the ground. And this group also the minority, the only 5% of total population of Sudan, if you look to the, back to the history. Uh, so that is why they, they left South Sudan as a Christian and African, marginalized. And also the other regions in, in Sudan, like Darfur, Nuba Mountain, they're purely black. Most, but most majority of them, they are Muslim. They subordinate it just to, to be a part of the following the, the, those uh, uh, in the north as the Arab the groups, just following to them. But it is not really have the same citizenship rights in the history of Sudan. So that is a problem, the centralization of the government since the uh, colonial period in Sudan. And when the colonial period, they want to leave the Sudan in, uh, in the background of the United Nations when they established in 1948 or 1945 or something like that, they have a recommendation that all the colonials should be removed or to be back withdrawn from the country under their uh, under their control. So for that reason, British started in 1952 to make uh, nationalization to Sudan. By 2015, they have to be out and hand over the power to the Sudanese. So the cause, the problem started here. They created like 800 jobs, civil jobs. They should be hand over to the Sudanese. So all these jobs have been given to the Northern group. It's not, all the, it's not including all the Sudanese. And also because they have opened them schools at that time in the north side, where in Khartoum and the, this, this side, and Egypt, because they took some students to Egypt. So they hand over the power to those people who had been educated at that time. There is no formal education in Sudan at that period of that time. So only eight jobs that have been over to other regions. Three to the south, uh, I think, you are only, yeah. Three to the south and the others is the null. Like Darfur is zero, uh, Kurdufan is zero, Blue Nile is zero, uh, West, uh, East also is zero. That is where the problem is started up to now. And all the high rankles of the leaders, they have been controlled by this group. So, uh, <coughs> after the independence of South Sudan, so how the South Sudanese, they lost the direction. So this is the very important point that people they have to look for. How the South Sudanese lost the direction to form an state. 
So if I come to this point, I have to talk uh, to the uh, CPA. For me, as Sudanese, I look for the CPA just like a deal. It is not an agreement. It is a deal. Because it is failed to make a full transformation to the objective of the agreement. Only achieved separation. And why this, the two parties accept that deal? Because the agreement gave South Sudan or the SPLM under the leadership of Dr. John Garan, whole South Sudan to be under his leadership. And the North was to be under the NCP without any with a clear way of transformation. And they knew that the North, the NCPA, they cannot give, they cannot transform the power according to the objective of the agreement. There is no democracy, no freedom of expression, no justice, and also no federation because they only have um, the centralizations. If you see, they written in the constitution of, uh, of, uh, of, of transitional period of Sudan that Sudan should be the, the federal state, they, have, uh, they should go for election, if, but they forge all these things. It is, in reality, it's not there. The, the last point it is, I like the way of uh, uh, the analysis, the theoretical analysis of the Sudan problem. Uh, what the role of international community that has been intervened in Sudan conflict to end this chaos? What is the role? That is very important. Because uh, we, we've seen so, even the, uh, when the conflict started in South Sudan, I'm there on the ground and I have seen Myself, I have been run to the UNAMIS compound for protection reason, purpose. I have been there for three days and then I have been evacuated to Juba and then to Uganda. But what I have seen, when the civilian ran to the UN compound in Bantio, so we've we seen that two, the, 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 what is called the post sign, post sign, they say that Dinka this site, Nowhere this side, completely I disappointed. How the UN writing such kind of this statement? They, they have to look the way that to make it the uh, situation so quite uh, acceptable, but they cannot put that this side. And also the SPLM is supposed to make a complete transformation to uh, the constitutional side of uh, to how to treat with the civilian issue. It has not happened. The military itself, it, it's remained at the way that has been constructed during the Revolution War. And the problem that has been happened back to the 1994, when the Riyak Mashar himself split it from SPLA and joined the Khartoum regime under an agreement that's called Khartoum Peace Agreement has been signed uh, 1997. At that time, I was uh, in, uh, I'm in the, my first year in university. So, most of the SPLM officers that remain with Dr. Yongarak in the bush, when because they suffered so a lot from what did by Riek Mashar himself, because allied with the government, Khartoum government, and they start fighting his colleagues on the bush. For that reason, he has been controlling all the unity field oil which has been run by the chinese and then has been backed so many militias from his tribe to control that site if not react has been split from spln in 19 for, uh, 1994 so i don't think the oil will be out from in sudan because of react mashar so, and for that reason, the officers in SPLM, after the independence, they have suspicion based on Riyak Mashar. They will not accept him as a, as a leader that to come and to lead the SPLM in South Sudan. That is, that is one of the problems. So, 
I've seen I've took so long time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that one. Uh, thank you very much. I'm yeah. very happy about the, theoret uh, the theoretical uh, presentation about this. It is truly the academical uh, explanation or narration. It is very nice and it captured, the, the, you managed to capture whole Sudan in a very precise way. Yeah, so thank you very much for this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll see that we don't have that much time, so I think we'll leave the word to our panel to answer first. Yeah, just one, uh, one more question, okay, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I'm Christine Tensenberg. Uh, I uh, do some work for YWCA, a small women organization in South Sudan. I've been doing so for the past three years. First of all, I want to appreciate this seminar and for highlighting this conflict that uh, has too little focus. Um, I want to give a challenge to psychologists without borders. Uh, I think when we do the analysis of the conflict, one aspect that is often lacking is uh, uh, the focus on what trauma, how trauma fuels into the war uh, that has earlier been mentioned here. Um, <coughs> I think uh, you have a role to play in highlighting that as um, um, one of the, the main factors for why the war now is continuing and also being more violent and brutal. Um, and the analysis is very important because, of course, that is where we get our solutions from. And the women organization that I, I work for, they say that there is no peace without trauma healing. We have to start with the individuals, and that's how we build a peaceful community. Uh, so I hope that you will uh, uh, take that upon you and, and have another seminar very soon uh, where we can go more into that also. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Over to the panel, if you. Oh, it's just, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you so much for, for very interesting comments and questions. We really appreciate that. We'll try to be uh, brief as we're running out of time. Um, I, of course, completely agree with the comments both from you, Andra, and from Marit that the issue of identities in Sudan is, of course, very, very complex and it's very difficult to kind of capture all the complexities in the racial factors and the ethnicity factors and the language factors and the regional factors and so forth uh, in, a, in, a, in a good and sufficient manner. Um, so I completely agree. Uh, more should be done uh, looking at this and I do think that psychology could have a nice role to play in going more into these issues and how they play out. Um, definitely all my respondents did discuss issues of power, issues of racism, discrimination, um, ethnic issues, focusing a lot also on regional identities. Um, uh, it's interesting what you say about race being more dominant in the Darfur negotiations than the North-South. That would be interesting to look at further. Um, I also think that, Marit, your point on um, national identity not necessarily um, curbing ethnic conflict, even though you do have cases like uh, Kenya with a strong national identity that does not then stop um, ethnic conflicts. That is precisely what is embedded in one of the theoretical frameworks that I took up. The, um, where groups can also internally in the country compete for prototypicality of a national identity. So for example in Kenya, the example that was brought up, there has been um, writings on some of the then the Kikuyus presenting themselves as Kenyans and the others as tribes, for example, this kind of who is more Kenyan or who is more of the national identity. So that is also something that psychology could then explore more. Uh, how do you create national identity? It was an excellent question and difficult to answer. There are some interesting case studies in, in uh, Africa, for example, where, as I said, we can look at leaders as entrepreneurs of hatred, but we can also look at leaders as entrepreneurs of solidarity or unity, where I've been doing some studies on how leaders are trying to or pretending to um, create unity and create a shared national identity, for example, in Rwanda or Zanzibar, offering then other cases to see how leaders are actively working with identities. Um, 
I also think that the question on the role of the international community in Sudan and what followed in the situation is very uh, interesting and key in this factor. And of course, they've been involved for so long that they, of course, play a very prominent role in this and that these social categorizations are actively used both by local leaders and then national leaders, but also by the international community, very well demonstrated by that Dinka Nur sign. So that's also something to be very aware of. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, yeah, it was a couple of questions regarding the, um, uh, how it looked like on the ground, <laughs> on, the, on the Upper Nile State regarding the, uh, the conflict there and in the, in the country as a whole. Well, um, what I experienced um, two and a half years ago, um, it didn't look good. It was not. It didn't seem like it was moving in a direct, uh, right direction. It was um, the conflict between the Dinkas and the Newers was so. Um, it seemed like it was so full of hate, and we couldn't employ uh, people from the two tribes into the compound. For example, uh, it was. Um, it was very, um, we were going very tough into each other and, uh, and this is the biggest tribes in the country uh, by far. I think the Dinkas is 40% the Nuris is 20 I think. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, yeah, yeah, of course, and the, the oil situation in the Polonai state, uh, it's there. Is this, this, this area around there, which, which it, uh, it's most rich in oil and Blue Nile State, I think, if I don't remember wrong. So it's an also, as you were talking about, a lot of uh, international agenda so, uh, there. And um, the government in South, South Sudan, um, it doesn't work. It's, it's uh, NGOs. Provide, providing the health uh, system for the whole country. Uh, if all the NGOs were moving out now, the, the country would collapse. It's no structure left. So, um, so from my point of view, it was, I didn't see any solution. It was just a chaos, but um, but uh, yeah, um, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, he asked about the the, the healing techniques, uh, the old uh, techniques uh, in the tribes versus the the westernized uh, medical point of view. Well, uh, in the clinic we were running in the in the refugee camp, um, we knew that a lot of people didn't trust modern Western um, science, so they preferred to stay in their uh, too cool or tent, uh, going to what did they call this witch doctors? Um, yeah, they had kind of witch doctors working in the, in the refugee camp and they preferred to go to them instead of going to the clinic. A lot of them were, of course, seriously traumatized and had uh, somatic problems as well. Uh, so um, that was an ongoing thing. And uh, I haven't been discussing this so much, but a lot of the patients coming into the mental health and which we uh, spoke with, didn't come back, so it can be an issue there as well. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know, a white man coming there and coming with the solutions to the problems may understandably be a bit provoking, so yeah, uh, it lies a lot under there, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, question there. Uh, 
in the clinic as a whole, it was more men. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I was thinking a female issue. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so the question was about um, if a woman was a victim of rape and she was coming to, uh, to the clinic, how we did uh, manage that. And uh, we had, um, in the mental health team, we had two women working in the clinic. And uh, Rebecca was usually, um, she was one of the ladies, and she was usually doing these consultations with the women victims of uh, victim of rape and also we had um, uh, a midwife coming from the maternity to doing some somatic checkup mm. so it was kind of collaboration between maternity and mental health and it was only women doing these kind of consultations yeah mm. yeah. yeah mm. all right yeah. do you Thank have any comments? No? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much for contributing to this seminar and uh, thank you guys for coming. And um, yeah, the next seminar is on the 9th of May about Afghanistan, so we really recommend that you come to that too. So thank you very much.